Welcome back to part three of the photographic tour of Fort Myers. Uh, the, in this part of the presentation, we're going to be concerning ourselves mostly with the north side of First Street between Jackson and Hendry Streets. But we're going to start off on the uh, southwest uh, corner of First and Jackson. Uh, but before we do that, uh, here are two views of the major boulevards. Uh, this is First Street looking eastward and uh, McGregor Boulevard to your right. And again, uh, with the palms planted along these uh, roadways, you can uh, surely understand why it became known as the City of Palms. Well, we are going to start off on the southwest corner of First and Lee Streets. Uh, this is the, uh, a photograph of the original Hill House that was located there. This is the original structure. In 1889, Mary Hill would uh, purchase the Hill House. Uh, the original building would be located here. She would expand it uh, and convert it into a boarding house. Uh, and over time, very soon, uh, she would have uh, a good number of repeat customers, especially salesmen. Uh, the salesmen liked the place because it had good food. Uh, she was a, a very good housekeeper and cook, uh, and the rooms were kept clean and they were cozy. So they were kind of an attractive place that uh, all of a sudden the salesmen found to their liking. Uh, not only salesmen, but visitors as well. Mary was assisted by her two daughters, Annie and Flossie. And uh, as time would go on, Flossie, who was, whose main job, at least in the public areas, was cleaning the uh, kerosene chimneys and making sure that all the lamps had enough fuel, uh, she would overhear salesmen talking about the sales trade. And uh, she would listen and, and uh start to learn things just from their conversations. And as time went on, these salesmen began to realize that uh, she had an interest in sales and they began to coach her, so to speak, or tutor her in the trade. Well, as time would go on, uh, young Flossie would become Flossie Hill and she would be noted for opening up the uh, first woman's store uh, in Cape Coral, uh, excuse me, in Fort Myers. Uh, it would open up in 1905 on First Street, uh, and it would, remain, it would remain on First Street uh, over the years until the 60s. As time would pass, business was good, and Mary Hill would uh, convert the wooden structure to this brick structure right here. And again, uh, this is uh, Lee Street here, and this is First Street in front of the building. Uh, in 1918, the property would be purchased by W.P. Franklin of the hardware store fame. And in 1924, uh, Franklin would build a seven-story addition. This addition would cost $120,000. And the structure would become known as the first skyscraper in Fort Myers. It had 102 rooms, uh, steam heated on the rooftop. Uh, there was a pergola and a garden for recreation. And it would become known as the Franklin Arms Hotel. This is a photograph taken in 1938 of the Franklin Arms Hotel property. Uh, again, this is the original uh, brick structure uh, Mary Hill had constructed prior to selling it. It was then added on here by Walter P. Franklin, as well as the first skyscraper, if you will, in Fort Myers. And this is a current view of the Franklin Arms Hotel. Uh, along First Street, the view from First Street, of uh, the original portion here and then the skyscraper portion. And the uh, view from uh, along Lee Street, which is over here, shows how the brick facade uh, had been uh, completed on the, uh, 
the Lee Street side of the building. Uh, this is an aerial view of where we uh, were just concentrating. Again, this is First Street and Lee Street is here. The Franklin Arms Hotel is here. Now we're going to be moving uh, westward uh, in this direction down First Street and concentrating all on the north side from now on. And we're going to end up uh, at Henry Street. This is an old photograph of the remnant of the Fort Commander's residence. Uh, back in 1866, uh, this residence was selected by Manuel Gonzalez, uh, which he converted to his residence. Uh, it was then uh, renovated and upgraded by the subsequent owners, uh, uh, one of the Hendrys, Lanier, RIO Travers was the uh, the last individual uh, up until as the story is now. Uh, in 1902, uh, Harvey Heitman would purchase the vacant house at the Seminole Lodge, uh, Gilliland's uh, residence uh, that Edison had uh, constructed there. Uh, it was vacant. Harvey Heitman purchased it and then he traded uh, the uh, building at the Seminole Lodge with for this building down here owned by RIO Travers at the time. Harvey Heitman had the home uh, redecorated, remodeled and upgraded. Uh, he would add a stone fence along First Street, which was topped with a, a wrought iron fence. Uh, uh, ornate, ornate exterior trim would be added, uh, and he landscaped the side and backyards uh, extensively. And uh, over time, it would become known for its outdoor parties. Now, the reason Heitman purchased this property was that it was on the corner of uh, First and Jackson, which is off the screen to the left. Uh, and he was building, as you, as you know from part two, he constructed most of the south side of, uh, of First Street between Hendry and Jackson. And he also constructed the entire north side between Jackson and Henry. So he purchased this place so he could overlook all his properties as the story goes. This old photograph shows uh, how things changed on the corner of First and Jackson. Uh, unfortunately, my video piece uh, obstructs part of it. Uh, this is Jackson Street here. First would be coming along in, in this direction. And Jackson Street, you notice the Jackson Street Pier out here. Uh, this is the beginnings of Bay Street right here. And this is the old, uh, if you want to call it Fort's Commander's, uh, the remnant of the Fort Commander's house, uh, the Heidman house. Uh, it has been moved uh, from uh, where my video screen is uh, back to this location. Harvey Heitman would die in 1922 from stomach cancer. Uh, in 1926, his home would be moved uh, back to this location here. His wife would be living in another, uh, another residence. And this uh, would become the first public library in the city. The remainder of this property here it had been planned by Harvey Heitman's brother, Gilmer, his younger brother, to construct a hotel on this site, but that never came to fruition. This site here would become the site of the Fort Myers Post Office, then the Federal Courthouse, and then the Sidney Byrne Davis Art Center, which is present today. And this is the remnant of the Fort Commander's house when it was a public library. And as you t take a close look, you can see that it's really falling to pieces. Uh, it was, uh, it had to be taken down in 1937, declared unsafe. Uh, and again, this was uh, the last remnant of from the fort. 
This photograph shows the Fort Myers Post Office building uh, taken in 1933. Uh, uh, this We are on First Street and Jackson Street. Uh, it was a WPA project. Again, uh, it was completed in October of 1933, costing $200,000. The exterior surface is of coquina, which is uh, uh, compressed shells in a limestone matrix. Uh, these were all obtained from Key West. At the time of its completion, uh, it was considered to be the most attractive post office in any city this size in the United States. One of the features the uh, post office had was outside uh, mailboxes, uh, and this would alleviate the crowding in the lobby, but more importantly, it will allow individuals to collect their mail after hours when the lobby would be closed. They could come by at any time, as you see this woman doing, and obtaining her mail. In 1965, it became converted to the federal courthouse building in Fort Myers. Uh, the new post office was relocated on Monroe Street. Uh, so from 65 up until uh, 1998, the federal courthouse would be here. In 1998, the federal court, new federal courthouse would be built. Uh, and we were there briefly uh, in part one because that is where the alternative history mural is attached to the side of. Uh, the building would remain vacant for a while. Uh, currently, it is now the uh, Sydney and Byrne Davis Art Center. This is a current photo of the Sydney and Byrne Davis Art Center. Uh, they are still renovating it, but it is open on the inside. It's continually going under uh, renovations, I'm sure. Uh, three points of interest for you if you go down there. Uh, first, uh, X indicates uh, a remnant of the outdoor post office boxes. They have been retained over the years, and they're on display here, so you get an idea. But again, this whole front facade, or most of it, were outdoor uh, uh, boxes. Now, in front on the sidewalk are two uh, metal cylinders uh, with cutouts. And uh, the best time to view these is at nighttime, because they're illuminated from the inside uh, with metal hal halide lights and they reflect onto the sidewalk uh, names. And uh, the cylinder number one, uh, if you know Latin, uh, you would then be able to read uh, the genus and species names of all the plants that Thomas Edison was experimenting with to try to develop a native source of rubber. Uh, this was prior to World War II. Uh, he uh, Henry Ford and Firestone uh, believed that uh, we would have to develop our own native source of rubber because at this time most of it was coming from the Far East and we were concerned about the expansion of Imperial Japan uh, at that time. Well, uh, all the genus and species names uh, of the plants that he experimented with are reflected onto the sidewalk from uh, number one. Now, number two, uh, there's probably nobody alive that can interpret it because it is supposed to be in the Makoki or Muscogee dialect, uh, Indian dialect. Uh, it was written by a, a Makoki chief uh, telling about the settling of the southeastern part of the United States by the Indians. It's a narrative. Uh, and you could uh, then read that if you were able to uh, from the sidewalk there. So these two are, are really kind of interesting to see at night, even if you're just down there some other reason. Just take a quick look uh, down in this area, and uh, I think you'll find it uh, very interesting. This is an 1895 photograph of Harvey Heitman's first store. 
Uh, Heitman would come to Fort Myers when he was a teenager and would work in his uncle Howell, uh, Howell Parker's general store. And he would learn very quickly uh, how to uh, please customers and what you would have to do in order to get continued business into your stores. Uh, he learned, as I said, quickly as far as uh, having on hand and supplying not only the local needs of the people in the area, but because there were so many uh, uh, wealthier individuals coming into this area for sport fishing uh, in San Carlos Bay, as well as along the Caloosahatchee, uh, sunshine visitors, so to speak, as well as sportsmen doing hunting in the area. Uh, he also would begin to uh, cater to this clientele as well. Uh, now, he was 23 years old when he, when he opened this store. And uh, initially, it carried mainly uh, groceries and some uh, marine supplies. Uh, but he would then expand so that he would carry fancy items as well as fancier foods for the people of wealthier tastes. And uh, not only that, but also cigars and liqueur and so forth. But he would also uh, supply the needs of the local people as well. And one of the things as you look through uh, the newspapers from uh, from years back, uh, he would begin to advertise on a regular basis in the Fort Myers Press uh, a varieties of sales all the time going on at Heitman's store and encouraging people to come in to uh, to see what was on hand. And uh, this, however, is like I said, his first store. Uh, this is not Harvey Heitman by any means. In 1897, uh, Harvey Heitman would build a brick store. And this is a photograph of uh, his brick store. And again, this is on the northwest corner of uh, Jackson Street and First Street. Uh, it was financed by Ambrose McGregor. Uh, Tootie McGregor's first husband. Uh, Ambrose took a liking to Harvey Heitman. He claimed that Heitman had grit and determination, and Ambrose liked that. He may have seen a little bit of himself in Harvey Heitman, uh, but I don't know. Well, at any rate, uh, the first brick building in Fort Myers uh, would be constructed, it would be Heitman's store. And at the time, it would be the only brick building between Tampa and Key West. Now, that sounds like a, a phenomenal accomplishment, but we have to remember that at this time, the, the area around here was not uh, permanently settled in high numbers. But at any rate, again, the first brick building uh, in Fort Myers. Now, an interesting side story is Harvey Heitman's younger brother, Gilmer, uh, when he was 19 years old. He just got out of college, uh, business college from Atlanta, and he comes down here because his brother's here. And he overhears cattlemen talking about how they, they would like to have a, a, a more rapid means of communication and so forth. Well, the most rapid means of communication back then was the telephone. Uh, Gilmer Heitman on his own would begin the first telephone service in Fort Myers. And uh, it would operate out of the second floor of his brother's store, a portion of the second floor, the uh, ground floor was all of the store, and the second uh, floor was offices. And he took over uh, two offices. And we do have photographs of Alice McCann, who was the first uh, switchboard operator at the switchboard. Uh, well, at any rate, uh, Gilmer Heitman would uh, perform most of the setup work uh, and would ultimately expand this telephone company into the Lee County Telephone Company. And this is really, you know, quite a, 
quite a feat for someone who is 19, 20 years old, uh, as well as his brother, who was 23. And uh, both would go on to start working on the uh, north side of First Street. This is poor planning on my part. The video portion takes over uh, a good part of uh, Heitman's store here, but the original store was up until this uh, yellow bar area, and then Heitman would expand. He would expand the brick building uh, westward toward the uh, Bradford Hotel, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. Now, in the adjacent storefronts, the first thing that went in uh, was a bakery, and secondly, uh, the site of the uh, Bank of Fort Myers. This is where the, uh, the first uh, office of the Bank of Fort Myers was located. It would then move to its new building across the street right here. Harvey Heitman was called uh, by some the father of First Street, and uh, he, he was a very experienced businessman at a young age. Uh, he, he would die in April of 1922 at age 49 from stomach cancer. Uh, his storefront would then be leased out, and this is the entire store at the time, was leased out to a grocer. And it would remain a grocery store for a while, and offices would continue to be located on the upper floor. This is a photograph from 1936, uh, again showing Heitman's uh, complex, Heitman's store, old store, uh, still a grocery at this point. And as you notice, First Street at this time uh, is all brick. And this is the uh, resulting efforts of both uh, Harvey and Gilmer Heitman. And we'll be talking about uh, this section in just a couple of minutes. From the late 1930s up until 1965, uh, Heitman's store uh, would become occupied by Sears Roebuck and Company. Uh, in 1965, Sears Roebuck would move to the Edison Mall. And during this time, uh, most of the downtown businesses would head out to either the Edison Mall or malls in the surrounding area. And the downtown uh, slowly, as in many other downtowns of this time, would start to become deserted. When Sears Roebuck moved out and headed to the Edison Mall, the uh, Heitman storefront was changed. It was completely remodeled by Harvey Heitman's daughter, Lorraine, and her husband. Uh, and uh, it, the storefront became occupied uh, by M. Flossie Hill. Uh, it was the woman's clothing store. Now, uh, you may remember earlier about Miss Hill opening the first woman's store in Fort Myers. Uh, she had died in the 50s. And at this point in time, uh, uh, the store was being run by her beneficiaries, believe it or not, and the store manager, uh, who were her trusted uh, her trusted manager and so forth. She had no children. She had no family. So what she did prior to her death was she sold uh, she gave I should say uh, shares of the store to uh, her loyal sales staff as well as managerial staff, uh, and they were running the store at this point in time. It would remain in the downtown area. Uh, and then very shortly later, it would move to the Edison Mall. And after a couple of years at the Edison Mall, uh, the store would finally close. And this is a current photograph of uh, the original Heitman store. Uh, again, this is Jackson Street here, and this is First Street, give you orientation. And the original storefront uh, went from uh, right about here to this area here, and then it began expanding on westward down the street. 
This portion of the north side of uh, First Street uh, is called the Bradford Annex, and it was part of the expansion of the Bradford Hotel. Uh, the hotel was over in uh, at the corner of Hendry and First Street, and uh, over time it began expanding down toward Jackson Street, uh, and this expansion was accomplished by Harvey Heitman. Uh, on the ground floor were shops, and uh, we'll talk about uh, what was there initially in just a minute, but the upper two floors were uh, parts of the Bradford Hotel. Well, today they are condominiums or uh, types of townhouses, if you will. Uh, there are 10 units that have been described as upside down townhouses. That is to say that the bedrooms and bathroom and study are on the second floor here and the kitchens and living rooms are on the third floor. So for that reason, they're called upside down townhouses. There's only 10 of them, however. Uh, but this is what is known uh, today and in the past as the Bradford Annex. Prior to the establishment or construction of the Bradford Annex, uh, there was an open air arcade here, which was enclosed and over time, then the uh, uh, Bradford Annex would expand over it. Uh, again, this was uh, all this construction was done by Harvey and Gilmer Heitman. Uh, in the arcade, there were small shops which lined both sides, and the theater present there uh, would offer initially vaudeville acts, magician, uh, uh, magician acts, local talent shows, plays, and concerts. Uh, it was uh, at the Bay Street area, it was low level, and uh, the theater itself flooded during the, in the 1920s during the series of hurricanes that hit this area. This is a photograph of the uh, arcade from the First Street entrance uh, right through here. There's also the Bay Street entrance. At the First Street entrance, you'll notice these uh, uh, metal uh, decorative figures that we have all through downtown. There's a couple of them here. And as you walk along First Street, as well as other streets uh, adjacent to First Street, you will see uh, several of these uh, in various locations. So this is the arcade entrance today. And again, the so-called Bradford Annex is above it. This is a photograph of the, uh, the uh, theater entrance from Bay Street. Uh, again, it was kind of low level down here. And as I stated, it flooded during the hurricanes and then it became renovated extensively after the flooding. Uh, Thomas Edison would enjoy coming here uh, to watch movies. It was converted over to, uh, to show movies as well as live acts. Uh, and then over the years, it would undergo several upgrades, renovations, and modernizations, uh, primarily as a movie theater. Uh, it would uh, be converted to a duplex theater or two theaters in one. Uh, and then back to a regular movie theater, and then it went vacant for a period of time. This is a photograph of the uh, ticket booth for the theater. Uh, and again, you can see that there's a variety of shops lining the arcade, as well as the theater entrance. And uh, the movie tonight that uh, they're seeing is After Office Hours with Clark Gable and Constance Bennett. And I wonder if this is a morally clean movie. We'll have to wait and see. This is a view of the arcade building from Bay Street. And this is a modern view of the theater entrance. Uh, today, uh, it is the Florida Repertory Theater. This is an aerial view of where we have been uh, recently. 
Uh, unfortunately, my video screen is blocking out the uh, uh, Sydney and Byrne Davis Art Center, which prior to that was the uh, uh, federal courthouse and then the post office building. But here in this complex, we have a Heitman store, and then we have the uh, Bradford Annex here with the arcade on the lower floor, the arcade theater, which today is the Florida Repertory Theater. Here again is First Street, and down here is Bay Street. And we are now approaching uh, the end of our tour, and that is the Bradford Hotel. This is a photograph of the Bradford Hotel. It's on the northeast corner of First and Hendry Street. Uh, this photograph was taken around 1910. And of course, uh, we talked about how the cattle and the livestock were finally banned from downtown in 1909, or at least roughly around that time. But notice in the, uh, in the middle of First Street, we still have the water trough. Uh, in this case for the horse, but if any cattle got loose, I'm sure that they would want to take a drink as well. Uh, the Bradford Hotel was built in 1905 uh, by Harvey Heitman. Uh, it was funded uh, in most part by Tootie McGregor, uh, the wife of Ambrose uh, McGregor, and she requested that the hotel be named after her newly deceased son, Bradford. Bradford suffered from a severe kidney disease. Uh, Ambrose McGregor died of cancer. And two years later, uh, uh, their son, Bradford, would also succumb uh, but to his kidney disease. Uh, the Bradford Hotel would open up on November 12th in 1905. And again, it was like the other hotels in Fort Myers, a European style. Uh, the ground floor were shops and businesses, and the upper floors were the, uh, the hotel rooms. And if, as you look off to the right, you will notice that, of course, the Bradford Annex does not exist. And there's basically a space in between because all there is at this time is the open air arcade a little bit farther down the block. The hotel initially had 41 rooms. Uh, the dining floor uh, was on, the dining room was on the second floor. And all of the rooms except for four were, had access to river breezes, which were able to uh, cool the rooms down. It catered primarily to travelers as well as salesmen, uh, visitors, sports fishermen, and sportsmen. Uh, and it was a, uh, a destination for a lot of the sportsmen in the area that would do hunting. And behind the hotel, it would have a pen for the hunting dogs uh, where they would be kept during the daytime. And at night, it was said that if you walk the halls of the Bradford, that you would know at which rooms the hunters were staying because their hunting dogs would be uh, adfixed to the doorknobs uh, with leashes, and they would be sleeping in the hallway there. So. Uh, this is how it looked. Again, businesses on uh, the ground floor. Uh, Walter P. Franklin had his hardware store, his initial hardware store uh, in this area right here. This is a photograph of the Bradford in 1915. Uh, again, you can see that the uh, annex is, uh, is starting to evolve. Uh, we have uh, Franklin's Hardware Store right here. Now, during this time, uh, Connie Mack's Philadelphia A's baseball team would come down to the Fort Myers area, and they would uh, uh, start training, spring training, down in this area because of the nice climate. Uh, and the players would stay at the Bradford Hotel. And kind of an interesting thing I came across, uh, in order to prevent the players from losing their entire salary gambling uh, and then not being able to eat and therefore not be able to be healthy enough to play good baseball, 
uh, the uh, meal money would be doled out uh, every day across the street by a team representative uh, to ensure that the players uh, would not lose all their salary, uh, at least at one time, and would at least be able to get maybe one good meal a day. And here is the Bradford in 1930s. Notice that the annex is uh, pretty much as we as we know it today. Uh, the arcade sign is just barely visible here. And uh, notice that the front facade has changed. They've added uh, this right over here. In the late 1930s, the Bradford Hotel would be sold to Mayor David Shepard. Uh, and uh, he would be not only the owner, but the manager. And again, uh, notice the ground floor shops. This is a photograph of the second floor lounge in the Bradford, taken about 1933, uh, spacious with a good deal of lighting and a skylight uh, right there through the uh, staircases. In the 1940s, it would expand to 100 rooms. Uh, the dining room, dining room would be moved down to the ground floor area. Uh, and the facade, uh, you will notice, will change over time ever so slightly. This is one of the advertisements that circulated in papers uh, up north. Uh, to encourage the parents of servicemen to come on down and visit their sons or daughters as they were being stationed in the Fort Myers area at either Page or Buckingham Fields. Uh, and you get an idea, you will enjoy your stay at Fort Myers' most popular hotel with good service, steam heat, an elevator, and so forth. Uh, A little bit of modernization has occurred, changes in the front facade uh, in the 1960s, uh, especially this slight addition here changes to an open air patio. In 1979, the Bradford would be purchased by Bill Smith Incorporated. Uh, law offices would be become a part of the ground floor. Uh, the upper two floors would become condominiums. And notice again how the uh, front facade over here has been changed. And this is the current view of the Bradford. Uh, and notice again the facade addition has changed back to almost its original uh, condition. And again, the Wilbur Smith Law Firm is in the bottom floor here. And there are condominiums or townhouses, if you will, on the uh, second and third floors. I'm now going to leave you on the southwest corner of Hendry and Main Street. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed and tolerated the, uh, the uh, walk through the downtown area. Uh, that you found it interesting, and I hope it uh, uh, causes you to go downtown to take a look at some of these buildings, uh, hopefully remember some of what I've uh, told you about them so you can get to appreciate them a little bit more. Thank you very much.